Roger currently is serving in a, in a church in Kansas. And he grew up in Honolulu. And when he was three, his brother pushed him out of a car. And he lived to tell the tale. That's the random fact he chose to give me to introduce him today. <laughs> he has a great many accomplishments, which you can read about, but he's going to reflect today with us about what we've learned so far. So I'll turn it over to Roger. Thank you, Santa. Hey, so uh, three years old, my older brother is Jason. Uh, there are four of us in the family. Jason is the oldest, I'm second. Garfield, before the cat, he was named. The youngest is Brandon, he's the mistake. So <laughs> of the four of us, Jason, three years older than I, he was six, I was three, we were making a left turn, and I was in the back seat on the right side, Jason's on the left, mom and dad are in the front, and Garfield is in between. And we took a left, and apparently my right side door was not secured, and so it swung open. Jason saw it as an opportunity. <laughs> And apparently, he shoved me out onto the street. And that wasn't the most unnerving part. The most unnerving part is that he had the presence of mind to reach out and grab the door <laughs> and close it gently, which would make Shanna very happy, by the way. No slamming doors tonight. A pop, apparently, two miles later, mom and dad are talking, Gar's in the middle, and, and dad turns around and says, J uh, Jason, where's Roger? <laughs> and Jason said, back there. <laughs> so, my conversation with you, the planning team, the leadership has graciously asked me to come back and have a conversation tonight just for a few minutes, tomorrow night for a few minutes, and then Sunday morning. It's a conversation, a sort of a, we call this a theological reflection time. And I wanted to break that down because I'm not sure that that all necessarily makes sense. Um, theological reflection by its nature. So the word obviously has to do with theology, right? So I want to break that down for you and for me. So theos is the Greek word for God. So theology, theos, comes from the Greek word for God. And then you know this, right? Logos is the Greek for word of or word about or study about. So theology is word of or word about or study about God. Uh, biology, bios is living things. And so the study of living things, biology, is the word about or words about living things, biology, theology, the whole thing, right? So the idea is a theologian is a person who talks about or studies about God. If you have ever thought about God or made any claim about God, if you texted OMG any point in your life, that is a theological claim, okay? It's not a very deep theological claim. But it is a theological claim. Part of what I resent is I worry that some of us who are these professional Christians who get paid to be Christian, I worry that some of us have given you the wrong message. And that is only those of us who have been to a place called seminary can talk about God. And that. So this whole idea of theological reflection then is a further conversation about daily opportunity to ponder what we have heard and how we have seen God active so far at Rendezvous. So my conversation with you tonight for a few more minutes, tomorrow night and then Sunday morning, is a conversation about how we have seen God active at Rendezvous. What I want to do is I want to remind you about you and how important you are. So this comes from the Acts of the Apostles. This is the second chapter. It is the birthday of the church. 
Just as we celebrated a birthday just a few moments ago, and any others of you who are having birthdays while we are here, this is the birthday of the church. It is the first day the church comes into being. So if you would read with me from Acts, the second chapter, the 14th through the 17th verses. Go ahead. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I have to say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young people shall see visions, and your old people shall dream dreams. This is the story of the church. There is no church before Acts chapter 2. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when it says Peter standing with the eleven, it's Peter and the disciples who have gathered together. Jesus told them, stay in Jerusalem and wait for my Holy Spirit to come. The Spirit comes. People gather around because they hear this amazing sound. It's during a major festival for the Jewish people. God always has amazing timing. There are people gathered from all over the world and they hear this sound and they come to this house where the disciples are gathered and these disciples emerge from the house and they begin to speak in a whole variety of languages. Not as if they learned it when they were in high school, but as if they were native speakers. And it confuses people because they think, wait, these guys can't possibly be speaking all these languages. Aren't these local boys? There's no way they could possibly be able to speak as if they studied these languages their whole lives. Some people say, well, they must be drunk, which is an amazing concept. So you have a glass of wine and you become fluent in Mandarin. <laughs> That's not my experience. And then Peter gets up and says, they're not drunk for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Actually, what's going on here is the people who accuse the disciples of being drunk, they're actually testing whether they're Jewish or not. Because if they were following the dietary laws for the festival, they would not have eaten or they wouldn't have a drink before noon. That's one of the rules of the festival. So it's not that they're drunk, it's that these aren't really Jews. That's what they're contesting. They don't actually belong to us. And then Peter shows off. He quotes from the prophet Joel to show that he really is Jewish. And he says, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And I want you to understand this. On the first day of the church of Jesus Christ, you are named. It says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young people shall... You are so important to the creator of the universe that on the first day of the church... You are named. That's how important your voice is. Now, I want to talk about this whole idea of to prophesy. Um, uh, a lot of us sort of think to prophesy is sort of to tell the future, like fortune tellers. That's actually not what happens in much of the Old Testament and New Testament. People who are prophets, they just speak God's truth. A prophet is someone who just speaks God's truth. It looks like they can predict the future because people mess up and they do stupid things. And a prophet comes to them and says, you know, God doesn't like that. If you keep on doing stupid things, being mean to each other, bad things are gonna happen. The people don't listen, they keep on being stupid and being mean to each other, and then bad things happen. And then they say, dang, she can tell the future. And she's like, no, I can just read the Bible. <laughs> so a prophet isn't so much a fortune teller as someone who speaks God's truth. When 
the prophet Joel and then Peter says you are supposed to prophesy we need you to speak God's truth and then the whole task that follows is you're also supposed to see visions and a visionary in the Bible is someone who sees the world as God sees it so our whole conversation during the course of this whole week is that you would what be the church you're supposed to be our prophets you're supposed to be our visionaries prophets speak God's visionaries show us the world as last night I was so grateful for Simon he showed us an example of how young people in the West Vancouver Church are being visionaries remember he said Thursday every Thursday he sent out young people they went out into West Vancouver and they began to talk to people to find out what people are needing and the number one answer came back people said we are lonely right I thought that was powerful I thought that's what visionaries do they help us see the world as God sees it and now the West Vancouver United Church has built a whole ministry around caring for people who are lonely on the first day of the church you are so important to God that you are named as prophets and visionaries I'm so grateful for the conversation that continues this morning Paula who I believe is a prophet and a visionary she speaks God's truth and she helps us see the world as God sees it she quoted something very powerful that's been sticking with me the entire day go it's beautiful it's beautiful I have an addendum what I would add is this go We will be a miserable church of Jesus Christ if you do not step up and do what God has called you to do. How dare you sit there and think. How dare you sit there and think, I'm only a kid. I can't do anything. You are so important to the creator of the universe that on the first day of the church's existence, God said you have a job description you're supposed to be our prophets you're supposed to be our visionaries that's your job so I was also compelled by this conversation when Paula was up here and the question there's a question that came over here um, what about what about when people say well we should take care of Canadians first what about this idea, this notion that our job is only to, to take care of Canada first? And I thought, you know, that's, that's a powerful, powerful question. Because quite frankly, as a citizen of the United States, our president ran on an America first platform and he was elected by people who said, yeah, we should just take care of America first. And we are in a dismal place as the United States and sadly that affects you and it affects Mexico and it affects the entire world prophets and visionaries prophets speak God's truth visionaries see the world as God sees it God does not see Canadian borders God does not see US borders God sees a world that God loves God sees human beings and has the love to call us all God's children so here's an exercise the next time somebody says to you well we should take care of our own Canadians first I need you to speak out about that because I worry that I didn't say enough and the consequence is that we have a president in the United States who is doing horrible horrible things so here's an exercise remember the consent rule okay don't just do this to someone without asking first but would you would you just look next to you and find out 
um, just, just in a piece of clothing. Don't do underwear, because that's inappropriate. <laughs> but get somebody to help you right now, and tell me, tell me what's on the label of your shirt, or your blouse, or your bag, or whatever. What country? Tell me the country of origin that you are finding in that. What's the label say? What is it? Um, I don't know what the it is. Indonesia. Indonesia? Ooh. OK, stop, stop, stop. Hey, somebody, somebody just, just, do, um, just do hash marks. Just count, right? Just count for me. Let's go. China? Vietnam? What? Indonesia? Bangladesh? Is, what else? Cambodia. What? What else? Bangladesh. Where? Mexico. Say it again. Philippines. Thank you. Okay. Does Does anybody have anybody have Cana Canadian clothing? Canadian clothing. Yes. Oh, good. So there are some Canadian clothing. Thank you. Nova Scotia. Thank you. The nation of Nova Scotia. Thank you. Well done. Hey, we are in Quebec. So what, what else? Guatemala? Where? Nicaragua? India? OK, so what, uh, what is that? How many? A lot. Nicaragua? The next, time, the next time someone says to you, Canada first, you say to them, excuse me, we are wearing the world. There is no such thing as Canada first. We are connected to the entire world. We can't look for just our people because according to God, there's no such thing. All people are our people. So as you think about this, there's something about us that throws us, right? That wants us to sort of think about just our people. So this is, this is one of my favorite Pixar clips. Let's go. See, even Pixar, even Disney picks up on the fact that we tend to try to think about just ourselves and our people first, right? And they're making fun of that. They're poking fun at you and me and saying, no, prophets speak God's truth. Visionaries help us see the world as God sees it. So one of the reasons why I'm so honored to be with you and in conversation with you is that I experience over and over again in my life young people who help me in their prophetic witness to Jesus Christ. Young people who help me see the world as God sees it. So before I did my doctoral work and taught for a number of years at a seminary in Atlanta and then left there to go to Kansas to serve this church where I am now, I was working for what, what you would call general council office. I actually worked for our general assembly. That's what the Presbyterian Church calls it. And I was worshiping in a congregation in Louisville, Kentucky as a youth ministry volunteer. We, were, we didn't have enough money to hire somebody, and so we were just all volunteers. I was working with a middle school youth group, and it was the end of our whole year. It was May, and we were finishing up. It was our last regular youth group meeting, and we got done early, and we had time. And so I said to the young people, okay, we have some time. What, what should we do? And Corey, who was right here, who's very, very driven, she has plans. Corey said, well, I'd like to go first. Let's talk about what we're going to be for the rest of our lives. And I said, that's, that, okay, we have time. Sure, let's talk about it. And Corey said, I want to talk first. And I said, sure, that's fine. And Corey said, um, I'm thinking I'm going to be uh, the first female CEO of a Fortune 500 corporation um, and then I'm thinking I'm going to be a Peace Corps volunteer. And I said, oh, okay, you can probably do both those things. And he says, good, good, that's my plan. I have plans. Fine. So we went around each person in our middle school group. Um, it got eventually to Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth had joined our youth group a year earlier. She was in seventh grade. She was super, super smart and very, very shy. She would bring all kinds of things with her to read when we had our lock-ins, our retreats, wherever we went on retreat. She had a hard time interacting with people. Uh, came to Elizabeth, and so I was eager to hear what she was going to say, what she thought God was calling her to be in life. And so I was surprised when Elizabeth said, I'm planning, I'm planning to be a school teacher. I think God wants me to be a school teacher. And I remember thinking, wow, I, I didn't expect that. I, I said, Elizabeth, why do you want to be a school teacher? And she said, well, I think God's calling me to be a school teacher because I hate school. <laughs> and I thought, okay. I said, Elizabeth, actually, there's something, usually people sense God's calling, they, they have a sense of joy about it. She goes, I know, I know, but this is different. I said, okay. She said, look at me. I am pear-shaped. I'm overweight. I'm fat. I have bad hair. I have thick glasses. I'm shy. I am way too smart. I am an easy target. She said, I hate school because every single day, at some point during the day, somebody picks on me. And I've gone during the whole year to each of my teachers, even the nice ones, and I've asked them for help. And they've said things to me like, oh, Elizabeth, just get a thicker skin. Or, oh, Elizabeth, just ignore them and they'll leave you alone. Or, oh, Elizabeth, just, just stop complaining. She said, none of my teachers have done anything, even the good ones. And she said, I'm going to be a school teacher so that when someone like me is in one of my classes and other students treat her or him like they're treating me, I'm going to go up to them and I'm going to say, excuse me. Stop that. That behavior is not allowed in this room. In this room, we treat everyone with kindness and respect. You may not treat people that way here. She said, that's why I want to be a school teacher. I hate school. And she's looking down, and she's not making eye contact, because she never did. And I'm thinking, oh, golly, I, I need to say something profound that's going to make this all right. I, well, I should quote scripture. I should quote something. I went to seminary. I should, um, uh, okay, Jesus wept. No, not quite. Uh, okay. Um, uh, and before I could say anything, which usually when I can't think of something to say, the Holy Spirit is saying, Roger, but I'll blunder in and make a mess of it still, right? Before I could say anything and make a mess of it, Amanda, who had not yet gone, at the other end of the circle, Amanda blurts out to Elizabeth across the circle, oh, um, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, that sounds terrible. I didn't know you were having to suffer the entire year. Elizabeth, I, I think you're wonderful. And I think you're beautiful. And I'm glad you're in our youth group. And then Elizabeth looked up, parted her hair, looked across the circle at Amanda, and said, I know. That's why I'm here at church. It's supposed to be different here. Okay, I need to tell you that at that point, I'm like openly weeping. I'm like, this is, I hate school, and then, and you, I know, and I didn't know, but you said I love, and you, this is so great. I, oh my gosh, I love this. And by then, our, our parents had come, right? And so they're, they're standing at the door thinking, why is Roger crying? And what, <laughs> what? And they're saying, Roger, we have to go. Our parents are saying, no, no, don't, don't. 
Roger, we have to go. Parents are waiting. No, can we, well, can we group hug and sing Kumbaya or something? I mean, this is like, this, I mean, I live for this stuff. This is like. You are given a job description on the first day of the Church of Jesus Christ. You are so important to the maker of the universe that you are named. You are our prophets. You are supposed to speak God's truth to us. You are our visionaries. You are supposed to help us see the world as God sees the world. Miserable is the church whose young people do not claim their job description as prophets and visionaries. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>